Happy New Year. Hi, I'm Philip Lumel. Welcome to No Uncertain Terms, the official podcast of the Turn Limits Movement for the week of January 3rd, 2022. Your sanctuary from partisan politics. What were the top term limits stories of last year? And what can we expect from 2022? Let's ask Scott Tillman, National Field Director for U.S. Term Limits. Hey, Scott. Hey, Phil. So, 2021 is now behind us. Did we make measurable progress in 2021? I mean, can we say that we moved the ball? We really can. We, we have a, a new achievement in um, the passing of the resolution and adding another one to our, uh, our tally, which is West Virginia. And there's, there's other things that we've done, too, that have really moved the ball. But the, the big one to point to is West Virginia and the fact that we passed another resolution. Okay, right. Because what we're talking about here is our goal of imposing tournaments on the U.S. Congress and our strategy of getting state after state to um, officially apply for a amendment writing convention under Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution limited to the subject of congressional term limits. The one measurable thing that we have that can show that we made a step towards our goal is to get another state. We have four now. Depending on how you count, we could have a lot more. But we have four certain where with the exact same language calling for the exact same thing in the exact same way. And so that was certainly the top story. But there was a whole lot of action this year, too. It's worth mentioning some of these others. Before we do, maybe um, we should talk about also our near misses on getting new states, because we got one state, that is to say we got both houses to approve the tournament's convention resolution. But we came close in in several, right? What were some of the others? We did. We've we've been very close in Arizona and Tennessee. Uh, We've also been, been... Close in um, Iowa, we uh, we introduced some stuff. Not as close in Iowa. It's not the best place for me to give an example. North Carolina, we got close. Louisiana, we got very close. So there's a lot of promising ones near on the horizon. Right. We, we actually got through a couple of chambers, too. I mean, I actually got a, a vote in, what, Georgia Senate, right, gave us a vote. Yeah, so we've got three states that we've already passed legislation in, and now we just need to come back and complete the other chamber. And those would be um, Georgia... Tennessee and North Carolina, and that's really promising when we when we're rolling into January, getting ready to go and, and start. And you're essentially you got you know one of the hurdles down. You got to get through two hurdles to get through the state. We've already got it pre-introduced in, in a lot of these places. It makes a huge difference. Sure, that is big news. In fact, I was going to call them near misses, but they're not misses yet. We just only got half the job done. You know, some other interesting things that happened this year. Uh, one thing that struck me. That is highly unusual, but uh, definitely shows the interest in the subject globally, is that Pope Francis, (laughs) the Bishop of Rome, the Catholic Church, mandated 10-year term limits on about 100 lay organizations across the globe that operate within the Catholic Church. He made the same points we make. He said that when these organizations became mature, they were relying too much on, say, the original founder and became sort of, sort of a cult of personality. And also the people on these boards, when they're there forever, they just lose energy. And so to revitalize them, um, to basically get them, you know, put a fire under them, uh, the Pope said that they've got to rotate. And, well, gee, that's the same thing we talk about when we talk about uh, the U.S. Congress. What else happened this year, Scott, worth mentioning? Oh, well, there was a, a lawsuit in the state of Michigan, uh, we actually had our state term limits challenged by a group of former legislators. There was 10 former legislators, and most of them had gone on to be lobbyists, and they decided they uh, they still hated Michigan's term limits, which politicians do, and they oh, were yeah. going to they were gonna come after it in federal court. And um, this had been challenged in federal court back in the 90s, and th- the challenge had gone down, and they didn't really bring up anything new, and the court took them to task and said, look... Um, you know, there's a great quote where the judge says, more than 20 years ago, the people of Michigan chose a citizen legislator and not a professional one. And now legislators with years of experience seek to use the federal courts to get around the state's sovereign choice. And it's they, they said it's not the judge's place or the court's place to intervene on their behalf. If they want to change the law, they have to go back to the ballot box like anybody else. And uh, they know that they can't win at the ballot box, which is why they try to sneak around and do it through the courts. 
that's going to be particularly gratifying for you because you live in Michigan, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was very excited to see that. They're always coming after it some way, so it's it's nice to, to be able to slap them down again. Oh, I know what a big one this year was. Um, in fact, there's two, and I, I guess they're somewhat related, or relatable anyways, and that is that Speaker of the House in Illinois, Michael Madigan, the longest-serving House Speaker in U.S. history, in any state, <laughs> after 37 years, uh, resigned. And he resigned as a result of corruption. And then, you know, he's a Democrat, as you know. And then the same year, over in Ohio legislature, House Speaker Larry Householder, a Republican, busted for corruption and had to resign as well. Well, and these are two great examples of institutional knowledge, okay? One, one of the most often things we hear from legislators is, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, you're going to lose all this institutional knowledge of people who... But these two speakers were using their institutional knowledge to line their pockets. And what they were doing was, in both cases, um, the scandals that arose were they were teaming up with essentially monopoly electric companies in their states to, you know, take a little bit from every rate payer and increase those rates. And then those companies were finding ways to make it pay for those two politicians. And because they're the speakers and because of their involvement, they're able to steal a little bit essentially from every taxpayer and every, not even all the taxpayers, from everybody in the state, even the people who are not taxpayers, anybody who pays for electricity in that state. And, uh, you know, this is the reason why we need term limits, because the longer somebody is in office, they do get institutional knowledge, and they use that institutional knowledge to game the system and line their own pockets. It's the crony capital. Right. They use it against us. Certainly, yeah. No, that's right. And those are excellent examples. They're pretty common examples, actually. Maybe not because their stature is is higher than usual. But all throughout the year, we had uh, many segments in our podcast of individual cases of corruption by people that oppose term limits, almost always is the case. Actually, I should say always is the case. Um, and so, yeah, these are two more examples. Larry Householder was such an opponent that he was actually working on a campaign to overturn Ohio's term limits as this corruption was going on. And it's actually tied to it. Some of the money that he was accepting from these util- utility was ending up in the campaign to undo Ohio's term limits. So another great example of how power can be abused and why term limits are, are so necessary. What else we got? We also started a new program this year at U.S. Term Limits where we now have state chairs in different states that are helping us with the uh, with right. the process in their states. And we have some really superstar state chairs that have signed up um, in Tennessee. Um, Glenn Jacobs, formerly a professional wrestler, I may be still a professional wrestler, I'm not 100% on that. Uh, he is now uh, the mayor of... Knox County, and he is in a term-limited position himself as the mayor and has come out strong on the issue of term limits and has been a great advocate. And we also have um, Dr. Cohen in Georgia and several other all over the country who are doing a great job with this, and we're, we're expanding that program. And these are people who understand the problem with Congress and want to advocate for term yeah. limits and take a leadership position in their states. And this is the first year that we've we've really worked on this. I'm looking at this list, and it's really impressive because these people don't just understand this situation. They are important in their own right. They've been very successful in either politics or in business or in other ways. I noticed that, um, you know, Sarah Hart Wire in, in Kansas, well, she was the former president and CEO of the National Down Syndrome Society, for instance, and she's taken this on as a new cause. We have people that... Um, uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Cowan in Georgia, he's a well-known neurosurgeon. You know, you just go down the list, and this is a impressive list of movers and shakers in these states. You know, oftentimes people say statesmen, and they refer to politicians, people who get elected to office and then go do things. But here you have community leaders who are successful outside of government, and they are they understand the changes that are needed or at least, you know, term limits is needed and and other changes that are needed and that the old career politicians and the old system where people sit there for 20 years and, uh, you know, 15 years before they get any position um, to actually make decisions is failing us. And these are people who are taking it upon themselves in their personal life to volunteer to do this and to be advocates for this, as well as the other projects that they've done on their own time and they're all successful in their life outside of politics, and they're all taking this step to um, help further this worthwhile cause. I think that's a really good point. 
You know, people talk about public service, and really, when you're elected, you're in power. Um, I don't know if that's really public service. When you are volunteering your time to work on a board for a, a private charity or something, or to work on a cause like this, you're not in power. You're actually serving. You know, you're not, you're not being paid to do it. That to me, that's real service and not seeking of power. One thing we should have mentioned probably right after West Virginia, our top story, is what's going on in Congress. Because, you know, our real measurable is how many states we get to call for the tournaments convention. But number two on our list of strategies is the one that we have going in the Congress, where we try to get as many candidates and incumbents in Congress to sign a pledge promising to um, co-sponsor and vote for a term limits amendment in Congress. And um, I know we've had a record year in getting that kind of support, and I know that you have the details on that. We really have. So this year, as, as people know, there's 435 members in the U.S. House, 100 members in the Senate. So you have 535 members. We currently have 94 pledged members in Congress. That's over 17 percent of Congress is now pledged to support term limits. And that number is going up every year. And occasionally we have to do some whip cracking to uh, to remind <coughs> congressmen and women that they have um, pledged to their constituents that they were going to support the term limits amendment. But even though we do, we do have to remind them, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but most everyone that will sign a pledge, they'll put pen to paper and commit to this, does, although we might have to knock on the door to remind them, but they do come out and end up co-sponsoring the bills, right? That, that is correct. And this year, I know I said that we have 94 who are in Congress currently. We have 200 and, over 280 new candidates running for Congress this next cycle who have signed the pledge already. And that number is going to go up very quickly here now that redistricting is getting finalized in different states and people will be jumping into the races here in the next two months. This is a public service announcement. After a contentious back and forth, with Representative Debbie Dingell of Michigan on our show in December, a frustrated Fox business anchor, Maria Bartiromo, took a parting shot at the congresswoman, worth revisiting. Let me ask you, Congresswoman, do you, do you believe in term limits? No, I don't, because I think term Why? limits... Why? Limit Why should somebody ability. be in the Senate for 40 years? They forget who they're working for. Why should somebody be in the... Con I mean, look at the leadership team that America has. Everybody's above 80. So the American people need to look at that, and it's called, term limits is called the election yeah, that you have. Well, in the House, it's every two years. And I, I mean, everybody says, don't you want to have longer terms? No, because it makes you keep accountable to the people that you represent. Yeah. And you know me, I'm home. Oh, I'd weekend. love to I'm see at, term limits, a reminder of who just, everybody's working for, Congresswoman. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about 2022. We got a new year beginning. You mentioned we already have been pre-filed in some states, so we're we're already into the uh, 2022 sessions with this, with some um, whiff of success here. What do we expect from this year? Are we going to get another state? And if so, uh, which states do you think are on the short list of becoming the next to call for a term limits convention? Well, I'll ask you for you your favorite, and I'll tell you mine. Um, we're pre-filed right now in Indiana, Arizona, Kentucky. In Idaho. Now, you might want to pick from that list or you might want to pick a different one, Phil, but which one do you think would be your top bet? I, I got to say that, um, you know, West Virginia was something else. And I know that one of the ringleaders of, of the success in West Virginia was Aaron Duquette, one of the uh, U.S. tournaments folks <clears throat> that just was tireless in um, contacting legislators, uh, keeping this alive in West Virginia, and really got the job done. And Aaron Duquette's working on Indiana. He's working on Kentucky, two of the states where we're pre-filed. And so I've got to say that I'm leaning towards those. I think that our next one, though, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick Arizona. A lot of groundwork in Arizona for a lot of years now. And uh, we've got some Democrats that are pledged there that are co-sponsors. We've got some Republicans that are pledged there that are co-sponsors. That's a place where a good bipartisan piece of legislation could really help a lot of people in leadership on both sides of the aisle, as well as in both chambers. I think it's really teed up. I think it's it's the right situation. And I think that, uh, you know, we have Ron Hooper out there. And uh, I, I, think, I think that Arizona 
is right there ready to go. And I hope that um, we can we can see it move quickly. A lot of times in Arizona, they're a legislature that, you know, adjourns for most of the year. They're not full time. And it's very easy for other things to become distractions for the legislature that they have to deal with a budget or uh, teachers um, contracts or or other funding issues. But I think this year things are teed up and everything's lined up. The planets are aligned. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be Arizona. OK. I know we got through several committees there last year, so we had made some some solid progress in the state, although we didn't we didn't actually uh, get a, get a vote. Or we didn't get a successful vote there. Um, all right, Arizona. And by the way, if you're listening to this podcast and you want to get involved with helping us, we can use all the help we can get calling and contacting legislators. If you reach out on our Facebook page, just put term limits in on Facebook. You'll come to one of our state pages or our national page. Send a message on Facebook or go to our um, website, termlimits.com, and there's a little way to message right through that. It'll pop up in your browser. But we can use the help. We've got a lot of candidates to reach out to. We've got good contact information for candidates, and we can use your help. All right. Well, it's going to be a good year. Yeah, we're going to get another state in 2022, at least one, and maybe we'll get all three of the ones we mentioned. There was some fun stories that had to deal with term limits. Was there one that stuck out to you at all this year, the, maybe the funnest story for term limits in 2021? Well, I, I mentioned the Pope. I thought that was a fun one. But, I, you know, there's another. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> one that I thought was fun was... Every once in a while, we get a legislator who will sign the pledge and allow us to send out press releases on their behalf, and not behalf of their candidacy in general, but you know, on behalf of this action they've taken. And they'll bask in the voters' approval, and then they get into office and they don't fulfill the pledge, right? They're supposed to, they sign the pledge, they get in the office, they're supposed to sign on to co-sponsor and vote for term limits um, con- uh, convention resolution and at the national level you know, onto the uh, Congressional Terms Amendment bill. <clears throat> Every once in a while, they don't. And we've used different uh, methods in that to try to, you know, put some fire underneath them. We have started putting up billboards. And one thing we found out is that politicians hate it when you put up billboards uh, that say something like, uh, so-and-so broke his tournament's pledge. We did it more than once, right? The one that stood out, uh, stands out to me that I recall is, is in Georgia, Drew Ferguson. In Noonan, Georgia, we put up a big <laughs> a big billboard that basically accused him of, um, accused him, hell, it uh, reported on the fact that he broke his pledge. Oh, my word. And it's right by his office, right? So he has to drive by it every day. <laughs> now, I don't know how many people notice it driving by, but I know one person who does, Drew Ferguson. And then Mr. Ferguson uh, was decided he was going to honor his pledge and, and uh, co-sponsor like he had told his uh, supporters that he would. It's sad it took that, but you know what? Once it's all over, he did what he said he was going to do, and now we're all happy, right? That's right. We are. And the voters are happy, too. Thanks for joining us for another episode of No Uncertain Terms. The term limits convention bills are moving through the state legislatures. This could be a breakthrough year for the term limits movement. To check on the status of the Term Limits Convention Resolution in your state, go to termlimits.com slash take action. There, you will see if it has been introduced and where it stands in the committee process on its way to the floor vote. If there's action to take, you'll see a take action button by your state. Click it. This will give you the opportunity to send a message to the most relevant legislators, urging them to support the legislation. They have to know you're watching. That's termlimits.com slash take action. If your state has already passed the term limits convention resolution or the bill's not been introduced in your state, you can still help. Please consider making a contribution to U.S. term limits. It is our aim to hit the reset button on the U.S. Congress, and you can help. Go to termlimits.com slash donate. Termlimits.com slash donate. Thanks. We'll be back next week. Contact your state lawmakers before they vote on term limits for Congress. Go to termlimits.com slash take action. U.S.T.L.